we come to our final speaker, Josh Richards, who's a physicist, comedian, and former soldier. He's also trying to add astronaut to that list um, as one of the one of 100 people shortlisted worldwide to colonize Mars in 2027 with the Mars One project. We're very happy to welcome him back, Josh. I do love that we uh, include soldier in that one. Has anyone ever blown anything up? Yeah, a few? There's a few? It tends to be a, a bit of a thing with little boys wanting to blow stuff up. Like, I, I got started early. I probably took things a little too far uh, when I started manufacturing napalm and military-grade explosives in my dad's shed at 15. But uh, it seems to be a thing that comes in amongst, like, little boys of wanting to blow things up. And the, the guy that I'm talking about tonight... Uh, got started quite early. He started his criminal career at 12 uh, when he strapped a bunch of rockets onto the side of his little toy cart uh, and tried to set a land speed record down the middle of a street in Poland. Uh, Werner von Braun got started very early. He had a real passion for rockets. He loved making things go fast. Uh, as some of his family tried to get him involved with, sort of, with science, tried to get involved with astronomy. Someone bought him a telescope. He kind of went... That's fun, that's nice, but I, I, I like, really like blowing things up. <laughs> and uh, he sort of, eventually, uh, the following year after he was arrested at 12, uh, <laughs> someone gave him a book by Hermann Oberth, uh, who is essentially the father of celestial mechanics. Uh, all of our understanding regarding orbital mechanics and that sort of stuff came from what Oberth did uh, at the end of the 1800s. And essentially... Uh, Little Werner sort of went, you know what, I can probably apply this science stuff to the blowing up stuff at the same time and put the two things together and decided that he wanted to be a rocket engineer. He wanted to build rockets for a living. Uh, so prior to that, wasn't that interested in science, wasn't that interested in engineering, decided to actually start to really dedicate himself to it. Went on, did a Bachelor of Engineering in Mechanical Engineering, uh, decided that probably they had to make some real breakthroughs. They couldn't really pursue rocket technology the way that it currently was. They needed to make some, do some real research and make some real breakthroughs. So he went on, did his PhD, and uh, he essentially did this incredible PhD looking at the way that you could use solid rockets to explore the solar system, uh, which was the public element of his PhD because the classified section was the part that the German army latched onto because uh, they got really excited, because this is 1930s Germany, and they got really excited about blowing shit up as well. <laughs> anyway, uh, the G German army classified an entire section of his PhD and uh, essentially turned around to him and said, yeah, you've, uh, you've got your, your PhD now, you're a doctor, but um, basically you've got the option of either, you know, joining the Nazi party and uh, doing what you're doing, or not doing what you've, in, you've shaped your entire life around for the last 30 years. And uh, Werner, like most good postdocs, uh, went with the funding. Um, <laughs> join the Nazi party. <laughs> anyway, they will do anything for money. Uh, but it was, it was a, bit of a bit of a match made in heaven for, uh, for Werner. He, he sort of, they, they set up this amazing facility uh, in a place called... Uh, Peter Munde, right up, right up on the Baltic Sea, right in northern Germany, uh, set up this entire facility, and the Nazis at the time were really, really excited about a guy called Robert Goddard. We have a few of us familiar with Robert Goddard? No? No? Most of you blank stares? The father of rocketry? Yeah, cool. Yeah, no? Well, <laughs> pretty much the opinion of the American public at the time, too. Uh, they basically told him he was an idiot, and uh, it wasn't until nine years after his death, uh, when they were about to land on the moon with Apollo 11, that the New York Times actually retracted and made an apology to Robert Goddard, nine years after his death, uh, because they had published an editorial while he was still alive saying that he was an idiot uh, for suggesting that rockets would work in space. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's a nasty little side note. Anyway, uh, it turns out the Nazis were really excited about Robert Goddard because uh, Goddard was the one who was doing all the research into liquid rockets. So up until that point, they'd been researching solid fuels uh, and all of a sudden here was Goddard turning around talking about all these amazing sort of different liquids that you could mix together and send stuff into space. And they basically built the facility at Peter Munday 
Uh, they stole a whole bunch of Goddard's research because he'd been trying to publish it everywhere and essentially it's kind of a, a bad citation if the Nazis are the people that are latching on to what you've done. <laughs> But uh, they, they brought the two together, and it was an amazing facility. They did all this incredible work. They, they developed anti-aircraft rockets. Uh, they developed the very first rocket planes. Uh, they started developing sort of uh, rocket-assisted jets uh, so that you could take off from a very short runway. But there was one, one project that um, Uncle Adolf got really excited about, <laughs> really, really excited about. Uh, it was called the A4, and the A4 was about 14 metres long, it's about 12 and a half tonnes. Uh, about one tonne of that was a oxygen balance compound uh, mixing TNT and ammonium nitrate together. Uh, and uh, he got really excited about this, but he's German. So the Germans have this really amazing history of giving things really violent names. Uh, so the A4 wasn't going to cut it. Like you've got Panzerfaust, which is like the, the anti-tank rockets that the Germans used in World War II, which actually sort of translates out to Armoured Fist. Uh, you know, Blitzkrieg is lightning war. Like, they're all about that sort of really graphic sort of interpretation of things. And so they, they decided to develop the vengeance weapons. Uh, so they'd already had the V1, the flying bomb. So uh, they rather intuitively and rather, you know, ingeniously decided to call this thing the V2. And, uh, yeah. When the first one launched and landed on London, uh, Werner had been involved. He'd been the, the chief designer and the leader for it. And uh, he wasn't real happy about having his rocket technology applied to, you know, killing people. Uh, he'd always been about space. He'd always been about exploring and that sort of things. And uh, the amazing quote from Werner von Braun uh, after it hit London was that um, the rocket worked perfectly. It just hit the wrong planet. Um, <laughs> which one of the satirists at the time translated out to, I aim for the stars and sometimes I hit London. Um, <laughs> awkward, very awkward. Uh, over 1,300 V2s hit London over the space of about two years. Uh, about 1,600 hit Antwerp, and that's a lot of rockets. Like, these things are big, really big. Uh, it took about 30 tonnes of potatoes to be able to produce the fuel for one V2 rocket. This is a country that's literally starving at the end of World War II, and they're throwing potatoes into making rocket fuel. Uh, but they made a lot of this stuff, and uh, I suppose the fantastic thing um, about the end of, of Germany, the end of World War II, is they were right into slavery, um, which is how they built rockets. So it turns out the V2 killed you know, just shy of 7,000 people when it actually hit uh, Antwerp and London. Uh, but they lost 20,000 people in the slave camps that were building the rockets at the time. Not so fucking funny now, is it? <laughs> grim, really grim. Uh, but essentially, it was the end of, end of the war. Uh, the V-2 was this dismal system, amazing rocket, but it completely and utterly destroyed Germany in the end. Uh, and it was right at the end of the war. Uh, the Germans, the Nazis knew they had these amazing scientists working away, and they knew that the Russians and the Americans were moving very, very close, you know, and they were concerned they were going to get captured. So they grabbed all this, their 500 scientists from Peter Monday up and tried to hide them. And they did this very poorly in something akin to the sound of music uh, <laughs> by trying to take them over the Al Austrian Alps. <laughs> And they just ran. And they ran to the first uh, group of Americans they could find, the 44th Infantry Division. And they went, hi, we're a bunch of rocket scientists. We'd like to leave. <laughs> and uh, as Danny mentioned, Operation Paperclip was in full swing at this stage. And they snatched them up. They grabbed all of them. They, uh, they bleached them of their Nazism. And they expatriated them back to uh, the US. And uh, Essentially, it just scattered them all over the place. Uh, and Werner wound up working with a whole team of the same folks he'd been working with in Peter Monday uh, in Alabama. Um, <laughs> as you do. Because there's nowhere you want to send a bunch of Germans who've just been murdering people because of their race uh, than somewhere like Alabama. <laughs> anyway, and... and uh, <laughs> He, uh, Werner, Werner von Braun worked with his team on basically what every German in 1950s Alabama was doing. Uh, 
and that was building nuclear weapons, uh, or at least the rockets that launched them. He got working on the Redstone rocket, which is essentially uh, this incredible rocket that was built out of the V2. They brought back a whole bunch of V2s to the US and tested them, and out of that came the Redstone. And this is where things change a little bit. This is the, the kind of the plot twist in the story, because up to this point, Werner's not a great guy. Uh, he hasn't done a lot of wonderful things. Really loves rockets, really excited about space. Has killed a whole bunch of people in the process. Uh, but it turns out that the Redstone rocket was perfect for launching the very first Americans into space. So they changed it, they made a few variations, they called it the Jupiter C, and they essentially put this tiny little tin can on the top of it, strapped a series of monkeys and then men uh, inside it, and then launched into space, and they became the first Americans in space. You know, the Soviets had beaten them by a month or so, but they became the first Americans in space launching on something that had been developed out of the V2 rocket program. And what came out of that was they developed the Jupiter C and they sort of went, you know what? Werner was a big fan of going bigger. Like the V2 was not a little rocket, the Jupiter C was bigger. He kind of decided to step it up a little bit. Uh, so he started working on what he referred to as the Saturn class of rockets. And for those of you that know anything about the Apollo program or about exploring the moon, it was the Saturn V that took 12 men to the moon. Uh, so Werner, who had started off strapping a bunch of fireworks onto his tiny little cart and getting arrested in some Polish street, <laughs> wound up being the guy who designed and led the team that built the rocket that took people to the moon, that took people to another planet. He was involved with 30,000 people dying in the process, but he took 12 men to the moon. Um, tainted victory. Anyway. Uh, Werner lost his nerve after the Apollo program. So he was always aiming for bigger. The, the plans that he involved, he was a huge science communicator, he was involved with some extraordinary programs, worked with Disney, produced three educational films about space exploration, wrote books, just absolutely extraordinary. And there was, there's almost a sense of absolution for the crimes that had been committed during World War II as a way of trying to make it up to the country that had invited him in and just, and, well, invited him in, abducted him and made him a citizen. Um, it's at that sense of absolution and trying to go further and make us better as a species. And uh, unfortunately, 1972 wasn't a great year for NASA. Uh, it was the end of the Apollo program. Uh, Apollo 17 came back, the last man, Eugene Cernan, stepped off the moon and came back. Um, and we've never gone back. Uh, and Werner had plans to go further. He was talking about plans about exploring Mars in the 1950s. He'd extended those plans throughout the 70s, the 80s. He was talking about going further. Uh, and 1972 was essentially when they started cutting NASA down, where all the budget cuts, all the amazing money that had been thrown at it for a decade, all of a sudden got chopped off. Uh, Werner at that stage had been put in charge of NASA's future projects. He was there to plan the future of NASA and yet he wasn't being given the money or the support to be able to plan the stuff that he was talking about. So he left in 1972 and it was unfortunately a bit of a downward spiral from there uh, and he was dead by 77. Um, the man lived and breathed for exploring space and his way of doing it was through rockets. It wasn't to try and just look through a telescope, it was to try and send us there. And it was just unfortunate that the first set of rockets that he built were the ones that didn't quite go to the stars but hit London instead. So uh, that is the story of Werner von Braun. Thank you.